Clinton, he told you that you shouldn't think about the education you're getting here, but look ahead, look into the future to the missionary service and the work to be done after you leave the school. This is a period of five and a half or six months, and then you go on to other service. We are ministers. We have been ministers for some time. Now Jehovah has extended a little special gift to us. What are we going to do? Are we going to show our appreciation for this that Jehovah has given us? Are we going to recognize the principle that Jehovah has set out that when much is given, more is going to be required? You have made a step forward. You have advanced. You have had an opportunity to take in knowledge that is going to be very beneficial to you in missionary work and service in the ministry wherever you go. What is going to be your future? Are you going to make a success of your ministry? Are you going to do the work that you have been given completely? What will you be doing a year from now, or three years from now, or five years from now? Will you still be a missionary? Will you still be in the place to which you were assigned? There is nothing so wonderful as success in the ministry. We want to remember why we came to Gilead, not just to today or next week, but in the years ahead. And the training that you have had here must have gone very deep down into your hearts. Your minds have been filled. Now you have before you a ministry, an open door, and you're stepping through it and going ahead. Many have gone before you, and their desire, too, was to complete the work, to make success of what they had undertaken. A missionary who is successful will always speak well of the missionary work. One of the missionaries of years gone by, one about whom the Bible tells us so much, is the Apostle Paul. This apostle was indeed a missionary and went to many parts of the world. He carried on his work in all kinds of conditions, and we find that as he came to the end of his life, which was the end of his missionary service, he wrote a letter to someone else quite a bit younger than he was and expressed his feelings about the missionary service, about the ministry that he had been assigned to perform, the last writing of the Apostle Paul is the second letter he wrote to Timothy. That is the last writing we have in the scriptures. It is in the fourth chapter that he speaks about his death. Just ahead of him was the pouring out of his life. and He wanted to say something to Timothy before that happened. Just before speaking of his death, which we find in the sixth and seventh verses of the fourth chapter, we find these words. You, though, keep your balance in all things, suffer evil, plead or thorough in what you are doing. The Apostle Paul had a very interesting ministry and we must say that he had a more difficult ministry in some ways than the ministry you face or that we face today. It's true that we've come to the last days when violence is increasing, that the apostle faced violence and persecution and many other things. The apostle had a burden to bear that in a way was quite a bit greater 
than what individual missionaries may bear in these days. Take our position as compared to his. Look at all the things Jehovah has provided. The Apostle Paul did not have a missionary home to look forward to. The Apostle Paul did not receive an allowance every month to help him carry on his work. He was not given the provisions of bedding, furniture, food, light, all the things that you will have to help you carry on your missionary work. The Apostle Paul had to go out and support himself. He had to use his own hands to provide the necessities and at the same time to go on in that service, that missionary work or that ministry and make a success of it. He wasn't unhappy about it. Even if we had to do that, we shouldn't be unhappy about it either. We have a very interesting comment that Paul made describing the things he had to do along this line. Acts chapter 20, speaking to the overseers of Ephesus. And he showed them that he'd been an example to them. In chapter 20, verse 33 and onward, he says, I've coveted no man's silver or gold or apparel. You yourselves know that these hands have attended to the needs of me and of those with me. I've exhibited to you in all things that by thus laboring you must assist those who are weak and must bear in mind the words of the Lord Jesus when he himself said, There is more happiness in giving than there is in receiving. He comments about what he had done, not to brag about it, but it was a statement of fact. He showed his position. With his own hands, he attended to his own needs and even the needs of those associated with him in the ministry at that time. And so he set an example. With labor, we have to assist those who are weak. This means happiness. Not happiness in giving money or clothing or things of that kind particularly, but the happiness in giving our strength and energy, giving of the knowledge, the things that Jehovah has provided for us through his spirit. There is where the real happiness comes. It was worth working for, worth going out and uh, finding a means of support for so that he could do these things for the benefit of those at Ephesus and the other places. And the Apostle Paul had great joy in so doing. There are many other references in the writings of Paul to the way he supported himself. So the scriptures do not leave us in doubt. And Paul had to go out and provide for himself and yet accomplish his work as a minister or missionary at the same time. We are getting assistance from Jehovah's organization. It's right, it's good, so that you can be looking one way. You don't have to think about finding a job in some place like Vietnam or somewhere in Africa or in Europe or any other part of the world. When you are sent there, you have the advantage of being received by some brothers already experienced in the missionary work, brothers who will in a loving way explain the circumstances under which you must work, tell you how to take care of yourself, help you to learn the language. You'll have a family, you'll have friends right away. Paul didn't always have these things. Some of the missionaries who went from here in years gone by had to go to countries and open them up, starting the work in some new land where there was no one who knew about Jehovah's kingdom purposes. But we see today Jehovah has prospered the work to the point where we have brothers all over the world. And so you will be going to assignments where you'll have somebody who is waiting for you, somebody who loves you, somebody who will help you. In order to accomplish your ministry, you may go through many experiences, but these are also good experiences. The 
The Apostle Paul, in order to carry on his ministry and missionary work, had many experiences, and he tells us about some of these. And I don't think that there are any of us who can say that we have been through the things that the Apostle Paul mentioned. We find in his dealing with the Corinthians that he sometimes had to write to them quite strongly, sternly. Some of them were not very theocratic in their outlook. In 2 Corinthians, in the 11th chapter, Paul, in showing his proof of ministry, comparing himself with some of those in the Corinthian congregation who were claiming to be such wonderful ministers, says here, beginning with verse 23, Are they ministers of Christ? I reply like a madman, I am more outstandingly one. Now, he tells us how. In labors more plentifully, in prisons more plentifully, in stripes to an excess, in near deaths often. By Jews I five times received forty strokes less one, three times I was beaten with rods, once I was stoned, three times I experienced shipwreck, a night and a day I have spent in the deep, in travels often, in dangers from rivers, in dangers from highwaymen, in dangers from my own race, in dangers from the nations, in dangers in the city, in dangers in the wilderness, in dangers at sea, in dangers among false brothers, in labor and toil, in sleepless nights often, in hunger and thirst, in abstinence from food many times, in cold and in nakedness. What an impressive list of experiences. All of these things, experiences of the Apostle Paul, because he was in the ministry. He had to go through those things in order to thoroughly accomplish his ministry. He didn't look for trouble, but these things happened to him, and these things may happen to some of you. All of us know that we are in a world dominated by Satan, and where we go, we may experience imprisonment, we may experience arrest, we may have troubles of one kind or another, such as the Apostle mentioned here. But when we see that the Apostle went through these things, and then when he comes to the end of his ministry, recommends to Timothy to accomplish your ministry, in other words, he says, well, you might have to go through these same kinds of experiences. Don't let it worry you. Suffer the evil. Do your missionary work. Thoroughly accomplish your ministry. When you go out to a strange land, chances are that you will arrive there safely and you'll not be shipwrecked on the way. You won't have to swim ashore. But you may have some narrow escapes sometimes. There are dangers in other lands. There are many thieves. There are all kinds of things that go on in this evil world. Fortunately, you have brothers waiting you to tell you how to take care of yourself wherever you go. Sometimes someone may come to you and tell you about things that happen in your country. There are many thieves in some places. They say that in some of the places, if a man falls asleep in the park, while he's sleeping, someone will run off with his shoes. Or if he sleeps with his mouth open, they'll take his false teeth. <laughs> well, now, is that going to scare you? Suppose you did lose your shoes. Suppose somebody did take something that belonged to you. It's happened to missionaries, even in the shipping of their personal effects. It's happened that someone might cut a hole in the side of a trunk and pull out whatever he could get out. But that's nothing to be discouraged about. We had one missionary sister who went to South America. She was actually from Chile. And when she was awaiting her luggage, it arrived on the ship, and then they put it on a truck to transport to the missionary home. And while it was on the truck, somebody stole it. So all her clothing was gone except what she had on. 
That didn't discourage her. All that was necessary was send a letter to the society, and in a few weeks the society had a shipment of clothing down there for her, contributed by the brothers around New York. So we see that we have an advantage. The Apostle Paul couldn't write to somebody and say, well, I need some clothing. No, but he had to go and work and take care of himself. Now, when we have these experiences, we, we don't want to be discouraged. You might uh, lose something that you cherish very much that can't be replaced. Some brothers have lost their diplomas through thefts. We've been able to replace them. Sometimes there are some things you can't replace. But you'll always remember that what you have in your mind is something nobody can take away from you. The experiences of serving Jehovah bring joy no matter what material losses might come. The sufferings that come, as the Apostle Paul had here, were not the things that really concerned him. What kept him happy was his privilege of giving for the benefit of people of goodwill. Mentioning all of these experiences to the Corinthians, he said, besides those things of an external kind, there is what rushes in on me from day to day, the anxiety for all the congregations. Who is weak, and I am not weak? And who is stumbled, and I am not incensed? Paul's heart was there with his brothers, with these new sheep that were being built up. We examine the things he wrote. We find how he did feel the anxiety for these congregations. The Galatians got all mixed up. Somebody was trying to lead them to believe that if they would follow the law, that they could get salvation by the law. And he had to write them and straighten them out. Look at the Corinthian congregation. They had some difficult people to deal with. They had competition. They were following personalities. They had immorality. Well, Paul was interested in those people and their spiritual welfare. So despite all the sufferings, the shipwreck, the beatings, the imprisonment, and everything else, he was thinking about them and their spiritual needs and writing them to keep them in the way that would be pleasing before Jehovah. The Philippians treated Paul very well, but they needed exhortation. His heart was with them. He exhorted them to continue on in the service. The Thessalonians seemed to get off track a little bit about the second presence of Christ. Well, Paul wasn't going to ignore that and let it go by, but they needed some counsel from him, and he wrote them. He was interested in them. We have our examples of Titus and Timothy as overseers in the congregation. Paul knew that the congregations being served by Timothy and Titus would benefit if Timothy and Titus served them well. So he went out of his way to give instruction to these men who were younger than he to help them accomplish their ministry. And this second letter that Paul wrote to Timothy should have been received by Timothy with great seriousness and it should have made a deep impression because it was from a man who was about to die, a man that Timothy had known and loved for years it was the sentiments of a man who wanted to see his younger brother succeed. So the Apostle Paul here, in giving his concluding advice about making a success of the ministry, called attention to himself. Not again, as we, say, we cannot say to brag or to, to say that he had done so much, but rather that this young min minister or missionary might know what to do. Now, Timothy was familiar with the life of the Apostle Paul. Paul didn't have to go into great detail, but we see in chapter 3, beginning in verse 10, he says, You have closely followed my teaching, my course of life, my purpose, my faith, my long-suffering, my love, my endurance, my persecutions, my sufferings, the kind of things that happened to me in Antioch, Iconium, Lystra, and so on. 
Why did he call these things to Timothy's attention? What was the reason? Because he wanted Timothy to keep those things in mind as things that are necessary for one who is going to accomplish his ministry. There must be teaching. Above all things, a missionary or minister is a teacher. He's giving out information, training people. And as one indulges in teaching, he develops the art of teaching. Paul calls it the art of teaching in chapter 4, the second verse. As you go out in the missionary fields, you're going to have to develop the art of teaching under different circumstances, different from what you have been experiencing in your home territory. Timothy had the benefit of being with Paul and observing his teaching methods and how Paul taught Timothy as well as the congregations that he served. We have the advantage of observing the teaching methods of Jehovah's Organization. We have the instructions from Jehovah's Organization. And these things make us more artful as teachers. As you go out to your assignments, you're going to have to contend with many different mental attitudes. You're going to have to examine the motives of the people to try to find out what they're really after and whether they are sheep or not. The society, in asking for your reports, will ask you to report on the number of persons that you help to publish in the service, the number that come to the point of dedication and those who remain serving Jehovah as dedicated persons. This puts before you the responsibility of teaching. And as you examine your report every month and you see these different spaces that you must fill out, your objective will stay strongly in your mind to help people learn the truth, to make ministers of them, to make them praisers of Jehovah. Certainly, you should be able to find at least one such person a year, and you should make it your goal as a minister or missionary to produce at least one new minister each year. Even a very active congregation publisher will do that, and some do more than that. In some territories, you will have more difficulty than others because you have strange religious teachings in the minds of people that have to be taken away you have many different motives. People where missionary work has been carried on by Christendom have been led to believe that a missionary is somebody who comes to you and if you get sick, he gives you medicine. If you need clothing, he gives you clothing. He'll teach you. He may teach you how to build a house. He may teach you any number of things. They're not really impressed by the fact that missionaries come around to teach people the Bible, but you're going to be a different kind of a missionary. And you'll find some of these people are, are very hard to figure out. You may be studying with them for two or three or four months before you discover what the real motive is. Sometimes they just like to have a social visit from you. You're an educated person. You come from a faraway place. It will elevate their social standing in the community. They can say that they have somebody of your stature coming to visit them. So they like you personally. Sometimes some older people who are a bit lonely will welcome the regular visits of a young missionary, not with the idea of learning the truth, but with the idea of having a visit, having somebody to talk to. So you have to become discerning. Your art of teaching has to be developed in such a way that when you're studying with people, you find out if they are getting the points. What are they learning? When you go back next week, what did they remember? Did they remember anything about the subject you considered or not? If they didn't, is the wrong with you and your way of teaching? Or is the wrong with them that they're really not thinking about this? They're going through an act, waiting for the chance to ask you, when do we get some rice? When do you give us some bread? When do we get some clothing? Don't waste your time on people that are not really interested in the truth. Personal appearance, their standing in the community, those things don't matter. 
Some of them you may find cannot read and write, and you'll have to teach them how to read and write along with teaching them the truth. But find out what their heart is like, what their motives are, so that you can produce, so that you will be happy in giving to them of your energy, your time, the knowledge that you have attained here, and also what you receive in regular study through the publications. Teaching is a wonderful experience, and you'll enjoy teaching people in different lands. If you study the way they think, make it an interesting, a very pleasant means of living among those people. Obviously, in order to be a teacher in another country, you're going to have to learn the language. So too much cannot be said about learning the language. You cannot convey ideas if you cannot express yourselves. So the quicker you learn the language, the better off you'll be. Some of the languages are more difficult than others, but go ahead and work on the language and study it if it takes three years or five years or whatever it takes you. Some people seem to have a gift for language and in a short time learn to speak and study with people and are able to convey the information. For others, it's more of a chore. But don't give up. Don't become discouraged. You'll be able to help someone by your ministry. If you learn a few words every week, if you apply yourself to studying the language carefully along with the other missionaries in the home to which you're assigned, you will be greatly blessed. You'll feel homesick, perhaps, if, if you don't learn the language. But if you learn the language, you'll be right at home with the people. If you, if you get a feeling of homesickness at any time, you'll know that the reason is you haven't learned the language. Because when you can talk to people and know them and understand them, you look forward to seeing them. You can just imagine if you walked into a congregation in the middle of Africa where they speak only Chinyanja, well, all you could do would be to smile and shake hands with somebody. It's about as far as you'd go. But if you're able to say a few words to them, and after a few weeks you begin to uh, communicate back and forth, then you're happy. And you'll be more happy the more you're able to express yourselves. So one of the keys to happiness in the missionary service is learning the language so you can talk to people and so you can teach them. Paul was able to speak a number of languages, so he was happy in his teaching work visiting the congregations around the Mediterranean area. Paul mentions, too, his course of life and his purpose. The apostle lived a life that was above reproach, a life of devotion, and he was not led away from the right course by any materialism or any desire of that kind. It's true that he had to do secular work at times, and we find in Acts 18 that he was making tents. He did not have the privilege of preaching with his full time, but as soon as he could, he got back into the preaching work every day, preaching, teaching, doing his ministry. So the course of life and his purpose in life, his, his settled determination to do Jehovah's will was never unclear. It was always clear what he wanted to do, clear to him and clear to those around him, shown by his wholeheartedness in his dedication to Jehovah. It was faith, as he mentions here, his faith that impelled him. It was a force in his life. And that's what you want to do is to keep your faith strong. Paul makes the expression in his remarks to Timothy here that he knew his crown of life was sure. There was his faith. He carried that faith with him for years in the ministry. And it must be the same with us. If we are to succeed in serving Jehovah, we must keep that vision of Jehovah's kingdom clear, keep our faith in him sure, and then no matter where we may be, even in isolated places, we will continue in our ministry. Through all our experiences, we must carry our faith with us. The apostle was not always dealt with by people in the congregations or those associated with him in a very kind and gentle way. Sometimes people would do things to him that could have offended him, 
But he was long-suffering, and that is something that is necessary to be successful in the ministry. Not complaining, but rather expressing our, our love for people. Uh, we had our watchtower bring to our attention yesterday the power of kindness, how that we even should show kindness to enemies. Long-suffering, kindness, and love, these things must be found in us if we're going to succeed in the ministry. Paul had a big heart toward all those he met, all kinds of men, and he injured no one. But he tried to build them up and taught others to love as he wrote the Corinthian congregation. Certainly his love for his brothers was outstanding. He gave of his energies, he gave all that he could. And in this we have an example as missionaries, how we must go to other places. We will live in missionary homes, and right there is, is where we start practicing our love, showing our love because we're living closely together with four or six or any number. We must show love for them. We must have happiness and peace and unity in the home, in the congregation meetings. Now, uh, there are a few missionaries who have gone out to some places and not succeeded in their work, and one of the reasons was because they did not love the brothers. Some may be showing up at the congregation meeting once in two weeks, if you can imagine that. Well, it's a form of spiritual sickness. Really, the basis was that they didn't want to be with those brothers. They did not love them. But if you have love for the brothers, wherever you go, you'll be most happy when you're with them. Paul was always happy to be with the brothers, happy to even write to them and to help them. This spirit of love must be seen among the missionaries. When you get out into your missionary assignment, you're going to try to train the brothers. Now, if you love those brothers, you're not going to be concerned about the fact that they don't have much schooling. They haven't had the material benefits that we may have in this country or some other places that are living on a higher standard. But they love Jehovah. They want to serve him. Sometimes there'll be a group of missionary sisters they go to a town, they start the work, they find some people. A congregation has to be formed. Who will be the congregation servant? Eventually, it's going to be one of those local brothers. Perhaps he may be a poor Indian brother in South America. He's very slow. He doesn't express himself too quickly. He doesn't always understand how all the service forms are filled out. Maybe he comes late to a meeting occasionally. Well. We have to love a brother who's trying to serve Jehovah and try to help him and be theocratic in dealing with them. So when we build a brother to the point of praising Jehovah and he becomes a publisher, then our love will be seen in our support for him. If he becomes a congregation servant, no matter how much we may know as compared to him, be theocratic and loving toward him, work with him, do whatever he says, and the congregation will grow because Jehovah's blessing will be there. You can be sure of that. Where there is love, there will be Jehovah's blessing. Love the people of goodwill. You'll find some problems, perhaps. Uh, some people don't live in a very clean house. You'll find the uh, cockroaches running around in the tropics very plentifully. They may crawl right over the book when you're studying. It's happened many times. Don't let it disturb you. The people that are there, if they love Jehovah, they're expressing uh, a tendency to accept the truth and serve Jehovah, these people can be taught and you'll find that they will improve in their cleanliness and their appearance and everything else as they learn the knowledge of the truth. It's going to mean love. You have to risk uh, life and limb sometimes to go to some places and do the missionary service and to endure abroad. It's nothing, really. Remember the things the Apostle Paul went through? All those things? You may get into a place where the, the climate is very hot or climate is very cold. Someone will come up to you and, well, it's happened to me. They come up and say, well, it's, don't you feel the heat? Isn't it terrible? And they get a little, uh, you might say, a negative statement off to you. But what can you say to them? 
Well, you can say to them, well, I was just thinking of uh, another place where I was, and uh, it's much hotter there, or it's much colder there than it is here. That's the way to look at it. If you travel around the world like uh, Brother Knorr has done, why, well, you'll find uh, there are all kinds of places in the world, and there are lots worse places than where the missionaries are assigned, and you can be sure of that. So while we do have love and we risk our, our life uh, sometimes to do the service, this love that we show and this, this giving of the truth, this effort we put into it, makes us happy. It means endurance. We can't uh, just go and expect that it's going to be easy and maybe in a year or so Armageddon will be here and then everything will be straightened out. Preaching must always be interesting. We must love the preaching. We must love the teaching. We must be happy to praise Jehovah. As long as we have that desire to praise Jehovah and we are around people, then we can make ourselves happy by giving something to those people and teaching them. You will find tests come upon you if you get into a place where there's not much interest. Some missionaries have worked in a place uh, maybe a year or two and haven't seen any results. It's a bit discouraging. Now, you may go to a Muslim country. Some places, they're very fanatical, and you cannot seem to make any progress. But what are you doing? You're giving the people a witness. If you get into a territory like that, don't lose your good, happy spirit. Rather, recognize that here is a chance for the people to accept the kingdom message. Jesus gave us the parable of the sheep and the goats. They're not all going to be sheep. Some are going to be goats. If they don't accept the message, if they don't accept the brothers of Christ Jesus the King, if they rather persecute them or abuse them, they're putting themselves in the goat class. But, well, we know that we're like the watchman, Ezekiel mentioned, that the blood is not going to be upon us. So even if we don't find too much success in the way of new sheep, we are doing the work that Jehovah gave us to do. We are doing our best and with this we can be happy. You will have to have endurance and patience in dealing with languages. You have to have customs to overcome. You find many things that may be disagreeable to you, but you can do it. Just remember 2 Corinthians 11, all the things the Apostle Paul said he went through. Surely those things, that many, will never happen to you. Missionaries have told me in my travels that they don't like the country they're in, but yet they had a happy spirit. Why? They said, here we have the desirable things of this nation. The only reason we're glad to be here is because there are so many sheep that are coming forth, and they are joining in the praise of Jehovah. Endurance in a land where the living conditions are not as good as they are at home will be easier for you if you are happy with your brothers, if you are rejoicing in Jehovah's service. And remember that we have missionaries that have graduated from this school. They've been in the service more than 15 years in different lands, and they're just as happy as they can be. The work is just as interesting today as it was when they went there. In fact, more so because now they know the people, the customs, and they become part of a family. You should see the hospitality and the kindness that people are expressing toward the missionary brothers, the appreciation for their ministry. It's a wonderful thing to see how the, the family spirit dwells among the brothers in many of these different countries to which the missionaries have been sent. So they're not looking for retirement. They are looking for more work. They are happy to look ahead even though persecutions may come. And we know what happened to the Apostle Paul and his persecutions. Some of you missionaries in these troubled days for the old world may experience persecutions too. But the things that Jehovah has given you here should help you to endure those and to keep your integrity. Right now we have two of the missionary brothers in prison in Shanghai. They've been there for over two years. How much longer they'll be there, we don't know. There's nothing that we can do for them. Can't even send them a letter. But we know that the communist Chinese 
will not be able to keep Jehovah's Spirit away from those brothers, and that they have this storehouse of knowledge that they build up that will keep them and will help them to bear their, their burden, to, to maintain their integrity no matter what may come. Paul had imprisonments. What did he say? When he was all finished with his course of life, he still recommended the missionary service, told Timothy to go ahead and do it and to do his ministry work thoroughly. And that'll be the same attitude of mind any missionary will have, no matter what experiences may come to him. The missionaries who went to the Dominican Republic had many things to endure. In order to help the brothers there, they took secular jobs because they couldn't do the missionary work anymore. But they stayed on and built the brothers up to maturity, and the congregations did not fall apart and disappear when the missionaries were finally picked up by the police and put on an airplane and sent out of the country. Those missionaries missed two of the big conventions in New York. Why? So they could be there helping those brothers in the Dominican Republic to gain the maturity they needed to stand up in a time of great difficulty. Sufferings come, as Paul shows Timothy, his sufferings, not just uh, through persecutions, but also through loss of some of our energy or health. Now, Paul and Timothy were both suffering under afflictions. They didn't have perfect health. And don't become disturbed in your missionary assignment the first time you have some sort of an illness. You might go to Africa and get malaria. Malaria is very common. It's nothing to worry about. There are ways of treating it. Many of the missionaries have it. They may have it uh, every two or three years, but they're still able to do their work. You might look back and say, well, now, if I'd never come to Africa, I'd never had malaria. No, you might stay in Canada and get pneumonia instead. People get sick all over the world. You know that. And as we grow older, five years, ten years pass, we may develop certain aches and pains. Our stomach may not work as well as it used to. It's not the fault of the missionary work. Don't look at it that way. This is a natural course of life for all people. We have to take certain risks when we go in the service. The Apostle Paul did, and when he came through all of these things, as we know, he still recommends the ministry. It's not so easy to be a circuit servant in some of these countries. You have to get used to things, put up with things. You travel around in the rural districts of Korea or the Philippines or Mexico or some of the South American countries or in Africa. Well, you may have an experience of sleeping in a little grass house. Maybe you'll be in, in a room with ten other people. That's the house. There's one room. They don't have the facilities, electric lights and running water and all these things that we're used to. But some brothers who, graduate, who are graduates of this school are putting up with these things. You can imagine having to dress and undress in such circumstances where you have to get used to those things. It's not easy. But you shouldn't be discouraged if that should be your assignment. Now, I've had a few experiences too, and I, I say that there's no use to blame the work for it. You might find a bed that's, uh, well, say five feet long, which isn't so good for me. <laughs> well, what are you going to do? Well, you make the best of it. I've been in places where you have to sleep on, under a mosquito net to keep the mosquitoes away from you. Well, all you, all you can do when you're my size is let your feet hang out, let them chew on your toes. <laughs> Somehow or other, you keep living, don't you? You come to the oriental places, uh, uh, you find the doorways are about five feet high. So you have to be careful. You always have to duck when you go in and out. And Sometimes you duck to go in, you can't see the ceiling, and when you stand up, you hit the ceiling. <laughs> so what are you going to do? Say, well, I don't like this country, I'm going home. No, you have great joy in each experience. Now, we laugh about some of these experiences I mentioned. Well, I do too. It wasn't so easy at the time. 
When you go through the African jungles for a, a day riding on a truck and all you have to drink is some cola that's about 100 degrees, why, uh, it isn't so good for you. You don't feel so well after it, but you're still alive. You're still able to preach. You're still in Jehovah's service. And all of these things, I say, are nothing like the things the Apostle Paul mentions there in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. So the thing Paul was doing here was calling Timothy's attention to all of the things he went through, the kind of life he led, so that Timothy could copy that and remember the example after Paul had finished his course. After Paul had died, Timothy was going to experience many more things. He should continue and thoroughly or completely do his work as a minister. Now, the real secret of accomplishing this is, why, is what Paul brings into the picture here as he goes on. And he says to Timothy, You, however, continue in the things you learned and were persuaded to believe, knowing from what persons you learned them, and that from infancy you have known the holy writings which are able to make you wise for salvation through the faith in connection with Christ Jesus. And he calls attention to the scriptures. This is most important. Never feel that now you have learned everything. Now you have been through Gilead. Now you've been through the Bible. You've studied it from one end to the other. You read it through before you came, and you read it while you were here. You've got it. This is food. The scriptures are our spiritual food. We get the watchtower. We have our textbooks. But we still must read the Bible. And every missionary, to really be strong spiritually, must set aside certain time when he will read the Bible. Now, we've probably read all of this in 2 Timothy many times. Here we are talking about it more and perhaps getting a little different point of view on some of these things. We're impressed by a certain feature, perhaps the fact that now Paul's giving his, his recommendation about the ministry. Well, every time you read the scriptures, you're going to learn something else. And that is our strong spiritual food. That is what we need to be able to accomplish all the other things. So wherever you go, whatever you are doing, don't be so busy studying language or anything else in your missionary assignment that you neglect the scriptures because here is the spiritual food that you must have. Paul says, continue in the things you learned. He calls his attention to the scriptures. The Bible is our food. Never forget it, because we need it to be able to endure. Your faith will be built up not only by reading these things, but by your experiences in seeing the things that Jehovah does for you. You want to be good teachers. You know that the light shines more and more, and you will be more mature, more artful teachers if you keep on studying the scriptures. Keep close to these and close to Jehovah, and you will continue maturing. Some of you may have a, an experience soon that is going to be a shock to you. You might not realize it now. A lot depends on your maturity. Here you have been associated with a group of brothers and sisters. Perhaps before you came to Gilead, you were pioneering in a congregation of 100 or 200 people. You have always had around you a lot of brothers. You can come to a gathering like this and see thousands. Even a circuit assembly in your circuit might be 2,000 people. There are some countries where we have six or seven publishers in the whole country. You go to that country. Immediately, those brothers think you are the most mature person in the world. Now, are you going to be that? You might say it's like uh, some young people getting married and having a baby. Then they take the baby over to uh, the grandmother and ask the grandmother to raise it. Because they're not mature enough, they don't know what to do themselves. They shouldn't have had the child if they're not going to take care of it, because it's a parent's obligation. In the missionary field, it's the same way. When you go into a country, you should be prepared to assume the position of a mature person, not babies anymore, not expecting everybody to wait on you, but rather you have to wait on everybody else. You have to look at it that way. 
And you have to be always ready to give good advice, good counsel, good help to those you're with because they say, this is a Gilead graduate. And if you do anything that's out of line, they're going to notice it. Some branch servants have even written to us and said, well, now, this brother might be all right if he were a native brother in our country, but he is a Gilead graduate. And his attitude, the way he is now dealing with these brothers, is detrimental to the work, and I recommend that he be sent home. And Brother Nor says, yes, I agree. And he writes that missionary and said, come back home. That's all you can do because this person is not assuming his position as a mature one, but he wants everybody to wait on him. If he's been waited on by his mother and father when he's been at home, and he thinks he can go to another country and be a little boy and have everybody take care of him, well, it's not going to work that way. What we've learned here is to help us to help others. Just think now, these brothers see you coming from far away to their country, they expect you to be a real example of a Christian in everything you do, your love, your kindness, your display of the fruitage of the Spirit. So try in every way to build them up by your course of action, by the way you conduct yourself, by your friendliness and interest in them, and assume the responsibility, the load that comes upon you. Don't be discouraged. Even if you teach somebody the truth and he serves for a little while and he stops, don't let that worry you. The Apostle Paul didn't. He had the experience of Demas and others forsaking him because they loved the world. You're still going to have some sheep with you. And you can see and I can see that the work the Apostle Paul did, all the seeds of truth that he planted, produced. All that work was not in vain. Some people may have stopped serving Jehovah, but not all. So when you're out in your service, if anyone should leave association with you and go back to the world, don't let it disturb you. Paul went on after calling Timothy's attention to the scriptures and concludes with the fourth chapter in which he mentions the need for Timothy to continue preaching in all seasons, favorable or unfavorable, to deal with the brothers, to exhort them and reprove them, to help them in every way, and to consider the matter as urgent, something very important that has to be done in a hurry. Nothing else, then, should be done first, and this preaching put aside till later. He says that some would come, and they wouldn't endure this, this healthful teaching. It'd be those who like to have their ears tickled, well, you'll have experiences like that. Surely, as we come down to the end of this test, there will be some who fail. Don't be disturbed by that, but just keep your integrity and keep on doing your work, as Paul says here, to keep your balance in all the things to do your missionary work. Some missionaries, unfortunately, have lost their balance because of getting interested in material things. Some have fallen away to love of pleasure. Some are just lazy. That's very unfortunate, isn't it? Very sad to know about, but these are things that are realities and we must face them. Paul is talking here about missionary work, and missionary work is work. Missionary work means getting up early, working hard all day, and really devoting yourself to your brothers and to the service of your God, Jehovah. Paul was a worker and he condemned those who didn't work. Jesus was a worker and Jehovah God is a worker. So it's missionary work that we want to make a success of. And we always want to look at that as, as the most desirable thing because truly the happy people are those who are busy. As soon as you find somebody complaining, unhappy, you find that he's not working. He's interested in thinking back like the ones who look back to the old world. That's the wrong frame of mind to get into. When you start doing that, you get into trouble. So we accept our position. We accept the burdens and responsibilities that come with missionary work. And as mature persons, then, we will go on, go ahead, 
and remember the example of the Apostle Paul. Now, there's nothing mysterious about how the Apostle Paul accomplished his ministry. We have the record right here in the scriptures, the record that he provided for us to use. When he came to the end of his ministry, he said, I'm ready, I'm already being poured out like a drink offering. The due time for my releasing is imminent. I have fought the right fight. I have run the course to the finish. I have observed the faith. From this time on, there is reserved for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me as a reward in that day, and yet not only to me, but also to all those who have loved his manifestation. Well, Paul saw that Jehovah was with him all the time. As he told uh, Timothy here also in this chapter, that the Lord stood near him and infused power into him, that his preaching might be completely accomplished. He now saw that it was completely accomplished, that he'd come to the end, but he knew that he had done it. That is our objective. We don't expect to finish our course like the Apostle Paul because we're coming near to the end of this wicked system of things. But we want to be able to say when Armageddon comes and the preaching work is done, the missionary service is finished, that we have fought this right fight. We have run the course to the finish and we have observed the faith. If we copy the example of the Apostle Paul and follow his advice, we will be able to do that. Ahead of us now are many glorious, wonderful, beautiful experiences. You're going to see Jehovah with you, just like the Apostle Paul did. Jehovah goes with us through every trial, and every experience that we have makes us more sure of the victory of our faith. It leaves no vacuum, no doubt, that Jehovah is with us and that he is letting us have a small share in the carrying out of his purpose to preach the good news throughout the world in these days. Victory is certain. The ministry remains open. When you go to some faraway country, there may be efforts to close down the preaching work, but as long as it's Jehovah's will, the preaching work will remain open. In Revelation chapter 3, we have the expression by Christ Jesus showing that he has the keys of David and that he has set before us an open door which no one, no man can shut. They can try and they may. And brothers have been in lands where bands have come on the work, but they have seen that Jehovah has gone with them. Even if the missionaries are put out of the country, the work goes on. You may someday be deported from some country. We have quite a record of missionaries in the office in Brooklyn. The card says, deported, deported, deported. It's no reproach. If you're deported from one country, there's going to be plenty of work to do in another. But the final end of it is going to be victory. The final end will be, if we are faithful and thoroughly accomplish our ministry, that we will be able to live in the new world in association with maybe hundreds or maybe even thousands of people who have learned the truth, who have come to enjoy life in the new world with us because of our ministry, because of our teaching, because we took the advice that the Apostle Paul gives here. We kept our balance in all things. We suffered evil. We did the missionary work, and we thoroughly accomplished our ministry. It's a wonderful prospect ahead for faithful servants of Jehovah. So wherever you go, whatever experiences may come to you in the missionary service, keep the same attitude as the Apostle Paul. Recommend the missionary service. Recommend the ministry, and urge everyone who asks you, or everyone you may have contact with to be faithful in the ministry, to do the work completely, just as the Apostle Paul, a veteran missionary, told Timothy, a young man. This should be your attitude then 
to keep on recommending this ministry, this work, to others wherever you may go. You have been here. You have been preparing yourself for this ministry for some time. You know that some are given a diploma to signify that they have accomplished a certain scholastic rating. This has been our custom for some time to give a diploma to those who work diligently and who are able to uh, absorb this knowledge and use it. It's a very fast course we have here, and some of the uh, brothers from time to time have found it too fast for them. They just always seem to be two weeks behind. So they say, well, now I would have had a diploma if the course had lasted two more weeks. The diploma is something good to have. Brother Knorr has told the classes before that you may never look at the diploma again after you leave here. I remember one sister in India who was reminding Brother Knorr of that expression. And when we were there, I think it was in Calcutta, the sister said to Brother Knorr, you told me when you gave me this diploma that I'd put it in the bottom of my trunk and I'd never look at it again. But she said, that isn't the way it's been. This diploma has been a real problem for me because of the humidity. It seems that over there every three months they have to take all their shoes and leather and leatherette articles and wipe the mold off of them. So every three months she takes up her diploma and the cover is a leatherette. She has to take the mold off of it. Well, she knows she got a diploma, doesn't she? But that's about the only time she looks at it. The diploma is not the important thing, but what do you have in your, in your brain? What, what have you stored up in your mind? What spiritual benefit have you taken from the association with the brothers here? How strong is your determination to thoroughly accomplish your ministry when you leave? Some of the best production of fruit has been in the missionary field by people who did not get a diploma because they have the fruitage of the Spirit. They are very high in their rating on kindness and love and hard work. We have some publishers who got no diploma at this school but who went in the missionary service just the same. They have produced 35 or 40 or more publishers of the good news. They're very happy. They never even think about diplomas. If you get a diploma, you may have some use for it sometime. In a few cases, we have used it to get persons into countries where we couldn't send them as missionaries, we send them as teachers or students in some university. Then it has been useful. The main thing to remember is the education, the training that you have received here and how you use the things that Jehovah has given you in trust. You have the prospect of receiving your diploma today. A few of you may not receive a diploma, but uh, this is nothing to be disturbed about. You're still a minister, and we love you just the same. It's no reproach. It's just for, probably that you weren't quite fast enough to keep up with the pace that we have in this course. But we could not hold the pace back so that others would not learn as much as they have. That's why we have to set a high standard for everyone to reach. When you get your diploma, you will also receive a message from Brother Knorr. And Brother Knorr is not able to be with us today, but he had this message prepared, and it reads as follows. Dear graduates of the 35th class of Gilead, you have looked forward to this day. Why? Because it will mean the beginning of a new privilege of service, a new assignment in your preaching of the good news of God's kingdom. Now you are more mature than you were five and a half months ago. You've learned so much from God's word. This should reflect itself in your daily living now. Paul wrote many encouraging words for our benefit. I'd like to quote for you Philippians 2, 1 to 5. If then there is any encouragement in Christ, if any consolation of love, if any sharing of spirit, 
if any tender affections and compassions make my joy full in that you are of the same mind and have the same love being joined together in soul holding the one thought in mind doing nothing out of contentiousness or out of egotism but with lowliness of mind considering that the others are superior to you keeping an eye not in personal interest just upon your own matters but also in personal interest upon those of the others. Keep this mental attitude in you which was also in Christ Jesus. In your new assignment, you will have the opportunity of doing just this, helping your brothers and helping the other sheep. What a wonderful thing it is to be in Jehovah's organization and to be able to seek peace and pursue it. Enclosed is a gift that the society wishes to give to you upon your leaving school. It will help you get started in the field service again. All of your brothers wish you well, and we pray that Jehovah's rich blessing will be upon you. May your days be filled with happiness as you continue to give Jehovah God exclusive devotion. Be assured of our prayers and warm love. Watchtower Bible and Tract Society of New York Incorporated and H. Noor President. Each one of you will receive that message with a gift from the society to help you on your way as you undertake this additional privilege of service. Now we will give you your diplomas and you may uh, come up here.